Thank you all. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the inaugural uh, Langston Hughes Lecture Series. And at this time, I am going to introduce Linda Rice, the chair of the English department, to continue with our program. Thanks again, and I look forward to seeing you all at the reception. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, good afternoon. I am Linda Rice, Chair of the Department of English. It is my honor to welcome you today to the inaugural Langston Hughes Lecture in honor of our colleague and friend, Amrit Singh. We are so honored to have Dr. Martha Cutler Cutter here, professor of, um, from the University of Connecticut, giving the inaugural lecture. She's uh, spent time with our graduate students already, and uh, we just thank you for all of the additional time and, and doing this special thing for us today. We are also honored to have with us Ohio University President Dwayne Nellis, Executive Vice President and Provost Chaudan Jalali, Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion Gigi Sekuban, and College of Arts and Sciences Interim Dean Joe Shields. Thank you all for being here on this really special occasion. I would also like to thank the many who have contributed to this event. Of course, our own English department, African American Studies, the College of Arts and Sciences, the Vice President for Research, the Multicultural Center, as well as academic departments, African Studies, Philosophy, and Religion, including the Gawandi Chair. I would especially like to thank Robin Mohammed for organizing the reception that will follow the lecture and Winsome for her help with uh, logistics and just the gracious hospitality that the Multicultural Center has offered us throughout. Thank you all for being here. This is a special day and a special lecture. And as sponsors, we join together in celebrating the way this event underscores key institutional values as expressed in President Nellis's strategic pathways for Ohio University, providing additional support and recognition to help, under, to help define the university as a national model with regard to diversity and inclusion, and creating an environment where difference in all of its forms is welcomed and celebrated. Next, I want to tell you something about the man behind this event. Dr. Amrit Singh joined Ohio University in 2006 as the Langston Hughes Professor of English. It is his wish to leave a legacy with regard to multicultural literary works and authors. As such, he is in the process of finalizing the establishment of the Langston Hughes Lecture Fund, which will serve to encourage events like today's into perpetuity here at Ohio University's campus. We are grateful for Professor Singh's vision for this lecture series, and it is with that spirit of gratitude that I would like to share with you a bit more about Amrit Singh, who he is, and what he has contributed to the profession. Before joining Ohio, Dr. Singh taught for 20 years at Rhode Island College, where he was named Mary Tucker Thorpe Professor of Arts and Sciences in 1991. At Rhode Island College, he also received the 2003 Alumni Association's Distinguished Faculty Award. Singh has held visiting professorships at Wesleyan University, New York University, the College of the Holy Cross, and the University of California. These uh, distinguished professorships have spanned a number of years and all um, are testaments to his greatness as a scholar and a teacher. Amrit Singh is the past president of three major professional organizations, the Society for the Study of Multi-Ethnic Literature of the United States, the South Asian Literary Association, and the Association for Commonwealth Literature and Language Studies. He has also served as the senior editor for the Multi-Ethnic Literatures of America series from Rutgers University Press, and he is currently the creative writing editor for South Asian Review. He serves on the editorial boards of several academic and literary journals in India, North America, and around the globe, including Remarkings, Journal of American Ethnic History, Asiatic, an Indian Journal of World Literature and Culture. His poems, as well as his translations from Punjabi poetry and fiction, have appeared in many prestigious journals, such as the Edinburgh Review, New Letters, Chelsea Magazine, and Salzburg Poetry Review. 
An internationally known literary critic and scholar, Amrit Singh has lectured and or taught widely at universities in Europe, Asia, Africa, and North America. In 2002, Singh was the senior prof Fulbright professor at the JFK Institute of North American Studies in Berlin. He also served as the Fulbright Senior Specialist in American Studies at the University of Graz, Austria in 2007 and at the University of Alexandria in Egypt in 2010. For 2014-15, he was a Fulbright Nehru Visiting Professor at the University of Delhi. Amrit Singh has been the recipient of many fellowships, including a Fulbright Doctoral Fellowship in 1968 and 69, the Ford Foundation Ethnic Studies Fellowship at NYU in 1972 to 73, the American Council of Learned Societies Fellowship at Yale University in 83 and 84, the NEH Fellowship for, at the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute at Harvard in 91 and 92, the Rockefeller Foundation Residency Fellowship in Bellagio, Italy in 1994, and the Killiam Scholar in Residence Fellowship at the University of Calgary, Canada in 1995. In 2007, he received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Society for, Multi for the Study of Multi-Ethnic Literature of the United States. In January 2014, he was awarded the Distinguished Achievement Award in Literary Scholarship by South Asian Literary S Association. In November of that same year, he received Ohio University's Faculty Award of Excellence in Global Engagement. Amrit was born in Rawalpindi in 1945 and grew up in Ambala Cantonment, India, where his father was a professor of literature at a local college. Amrit was educated in North India and held academic positions at the University of Delhi from 1965 to 68, the University of Hyderabad in 1977 and 78, and the University of Rajasthan in Jaipur from 1978 to 83. During 1974 to 77, he served as academic associate and deputy director at the American Studies Research Center, then the largest collection in American studies outside the United States. Amrit first came to the United States in 1968 on a Fulbright Fellowship to do his PhD at NYU, where he finished his doctoral dissertation in 1973 on the Harlem Renaissance under the direction of Professor William M. Gibson, Professor James W. Tuttleton, and novelist Ralph Ellison. From 1970 to 74, Singh held teaching positions at NYU and Herbert H. Lehman College of City University of New York. Singh's scholarly interests include African American studies and South Asian studies, as well as inter-ethnic uh, inter migration, transnational, and post-colonial studies. His work examines the issues of borders and border crossings in both North America and South Asia at the cusp of post-colonial theory and critical race theory. Across nearly four decades of scholarship from 1976 to 2018, Singh has authored, edited, or co-edited more than 15 books. He has also edited reprint editions of Wallace Thurman's Infants of Spring and Richard Wright's Color Curtain and Black Power. And he has co-edited special issues of important journals in his field, including Comparative Literature Studies, Langston Hughes Review, and South Asian Review, as well as others. Currently, Amrit is writing a personal book on India and the United States. In May of last year, Farley Dickinson published a fesh script for Professor Singh titled Crossing Borders, Essays on Literature, Culture, and Society in um, Honor of Amrit Singh. As you can see, Amrit is one very busy, very accomplished, and very celebrated professor and scholar. Please join me in a round of applause in honor of the man with the vision for this lecture series, Ohio University's own Langston Hughes Professor of English, Dr. Amrit Singh.
Good afternoon, I'm Joe Shields. I'm the Interim Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and it's my pleasure to join you here on this special occasion and thank you for being with us today. Um, I'm pleased to be here for the inaugural Langston Hughes Lecture. And the focus of this new series on multicultural and cross-cultural topics is particularly meaningful in relation to the mission of the College of Arts and Sciences, which I'm privileged to lead at this time. The college has a central role in equipping Ohio University students with elements of a liberal arts education. This is something we tend to take for granted sometimes, but it's important to reflect on what that means. The hallmarks of such an education are connection with a broad range of foundational knowledge drawn from human culture, society, and the natural world. Acquaintance with diverse modes of inquiry and thought, what we call critical thinking, with broad applicability to questions in all dimensions of life. And facility in logical reasoning, empathy, problem solving, and effective communication of ideas. The study of human cultures and their intersections provides a very rich basis for advancing critical thinking and the liberal arts ideal in all the dimensions that I just mentioned. Engagement with multicultural and cross-cultural studies is also inherently practical. In fact, I would characterize it as essential. In order to prepare our students to function in an increasingly global world, we need to equip them with an understanding of different cultures and their traditions and values. Domestically, we live in an increasingly diverse society, and we need to similarly prepare our students to function as neighbors and citizens in the resulting mix of cultural backgrounds. For these reasons, the Langston Hughes Lectureship represents an important addition that will benefit our students and faculty and continue the tradition that Dr. Singh has promoted through his scholarship and teaching. I consequently want to thank Professor Amrit Singh for his leadership in making the Langston Hughes Lecture a reality and to express my appreciation to today's speaker, Professor Cutter, for bringing her insights to this audience. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dwayne Nellis, president of Ohio University, and proud to be president of this great university and celebrating this very spe special lecture today. And thank you, uh, Interim Dean Shields, for your uh, words. And I also greatly appreciate Dr. Shields' leadership during this important time for the College of Arts and Sciences and as we look to the future and the importance of the liberal arts and sciences to the core uh, of our university and, and we celebrate it every day here at Ohio University. This is a very exciting event not only for the college but for our university. Uh, lectures like this are so very, very important to our faculty, our students, and I see a number of community members here as well today. This is truly part of the transformational learning uh, experience that Ohio University champions. And I want to thank Dr. Singh as well for bringing us all here today for the inaugural Langston Hughes Lecture. And I'd also like to join in congratulating uh, Dr. Singh for his uh, illustrious career and his commitment to Ohio University. So thank you, Dr. Singh, for your important contributions to Ohio University and to the field of English. You know, Langston Hughes was well-traveled. He was curious about the world around him and the people in it. At Ohio University, as Dr. Rice mentioned earlier, diversity and inclusion is a value we hold at the highest level. And indeed, it's the number one strategic pathway uh, for our university moving forward. And I'm, I'm proud of that. And I'm also proud that one of the first decisions I made was to create a vice president for diversity and inclusion. And I'm very proud, I believe, Dr. Gigi Sakubin is here today, and we certainly ce celebrate her leadership uh, as part of our uh, university. Um, so uh, this lecture series fits so well, again, within the university's long-term diversity and inclusion goals, and, I, and again, the, we're just so pleased to have Dr. Cutter here as well today, and I'm thrilled to be attending this inaugural lecture, and again, thank you all for being here today. And I look forward to, again, Dr. Cutter's comments. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you all, uh, uh, Dr. Linda Rice, uh, uh, Professor Joe Shield, Dean Joe Shields, and President Nellis. Uh, I'm uh, kind of uh, overwhelmed, especially by Linda's uh, very fulsome uh, reading of my bio. Uh, uh, I think I'm um, going to disappoint uh, some of you. I'm still mid-career. <laughs> so don't write me off. <laughs> uh, the Fesh Rift Crossing Border, to which uh, Martha contributed, as well as Professor Thaddeus Davis, who has traveled specially for this occasion from Nashville. She is in the process of retiring from University of Pennsylvania. Thank you, Thaddeus. She is in the back there. Uh, you'll have a chance to say hello to her uh, uh, during the reception. Uh, I have been asked to, I really wanted no part of this program, and you can see why. But uh, I have been asked, uh, and there's been some insistence upon my introducing Dr. Martha Cutter, and I'm very happy to do that. Uh, Martha and I have uh, worked together in MELUS. It's been referred to a couple of times already, the Society for the Study of uh, Multi- ethnic literature of the United States. Uh, I was a founding member in 1973, and the incentive to start that was in 1972, uh, MLA, Modern Language Association, would not allow even a session on what was called Negro literature. So we had, we had to hold a session in the hallway, and then a a uh, woman named Catherine Newman, who taught at Westchester College, Westchester University now, she said we should form our own organization. And now it's a vibrant organization, and under Martha Cutter's editorship, uh, it uh, was taken over by Oxford University Press for publication. She likes to always tell me she was the editor-in-chief. <laughs> Uh, once I made the mistake of referring to her as the executive editor, and she immediately <laughs> corrected me. Uh, uh, so Martha is a wonderful person to be around, and she's contributed a lot. What I like about her is the reason she was uh, chosen as the first speaker in this series. She works in both African-American and Asian-American. And apart from the fact that uh, I am teaching a graduate course that uh, deals with uh, both those narratives in the history of migration and citizenship, and she has been, as uh, Dr. Rice said, she has been wonderful in giving such uh, detailed and uh, you know, warm uh, feedback to the class, which fully enrolled graduate class. But also just, uh, I think it fits in with the spirit of Langston Hughes and with whatever I have done so far, to have these uh, open borders, to be able to read across ethnicities and races and nations and boundaries, because there is so much that we share uh, across uh, these boundaries which are uh, insisted upon and sometimes reified uh, at human cost and all kinds of. So uh, more specifically, Professor Cutter comes to us from the Department of English and African American Studies at the University of Connecticut. Uh, I heard rumors that uh, when she was at Kent, Ohio for a long time, that she used to be taller. <laughs> you know what Connecticut will do to you. <laughs> and I used to be shorter when I was in Rhode Island. <laughs> I've grown taller since I came here. She stands tall. She always stands tall. And she has stood tall for her values, her vision, and her uh, perspectives on American literature in uh, all varieties. She is the author of three books, Unruly Tongue, Language and Identity in American Women's Writing, 1998. Lost and Found in Translation, Contemporary Ethnic American Writing and the Politics of Language Diversity, 
2005 from the University of North Carolina Press. This is a book uh, many of my students will find useful in the work they are doing still. And The Illustrated Slave, Empathy, Graphic Narrative, and Visual Culture of the Transatlantic Abolitional Moment. In literature and in literary studies, there are no borders. We are free to roam across imagination and language and emotion and connect with any writer of any background. And I think it's very important to remember, and I think in establishing this series, I want students particularly uh, and my colleagues to remember that for as long as uh, they can continue to organize this uh, event. It's not about Langston Hughes. It's not even about African American studies. Although they, the African American studies will remain a major part of this series. It is, as uh, uh, Dean Shields pointed out, on any appropriately cross-cultural, multicultural issues. Africa and South Asia are not excluded. Ethnic American literature is not included. Jewish American literature is not excluded. Uh, Native American studies are not included, uh, excluded. So it will be up to the committees and the colleagues uh, to decide on uh, what to emphasize in a particular year. She is also the co-editor of a collection of essays on multi-ethnic graphic narrative, redrawing the historical past, history, memory, and multi-ethnic graphic novels this year. And uh, I know she has a couple of other books in the works. Uh, uh, she has published over 35 articles, our book chapters on women writers, American multi-ethnic literature, African-American literature, abolition, and racial passing. She was also the senior editor in addition to the, being the editor of Mellus from Oxford University Press. She was also the editor of Legacy, a journal of American women writers for eight years, 2006 to 2014. She has won numerous awards for research and her editorship of uh, scholarly journals, including the College English Association's Award for the Best Book in Literary Theory Criticism in 2000, a University of Connecticut Humanities Grant for her work on The Illustrated Slave in 2015, a Provost Fellowship from the University of Connecticut in 2007, and a CELJ, Council of Editors of Learned Journals, Award for the Best Journal in North American Study. And guess for which journal? For Mellis. I was a deputy editor of that journal for 13 years, uh, responsible for book reviews from 1986 to 1999, and I'm very proud of uh, what it has done. They are very much into mentorship, uh, if uh, they are not going to accept an article, as uh, long as they can find the time, they'll try to mentor that article for submission to some other journal. And uh, it's a great organization. I was a founding member. I'm very proud to be associated with These words, Professor Cutter. There we go. How's that? Yeah. Everybody hear me? Okay, great. Hang on a second here. Get a sip of water. All right, okay. <laughs> we'll do some more pictures later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. All right. No, I, wasn't, I was not ready. Okay, here we okay, go. Okay, one more. <laughs> Thank you. Was he doing rabbit ears on that one behind my head? All right. Um, thank you all for coming. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah? Okay, great. Um, I want to start by thanking everybody for um, making this visit possible. Thanks also for everybody coming today. I know it's the day after Thanksgiving, and I can barely get students to come to class sometimes, and so I appreciate everybody being here. Um, also, I want to thank everybody for this visit. Um, Amrajit, first, most of all, um, for uh, putting this whole thing together and being such a good friend to me. And even this morning, I think he has ESP because I was dying for a banana. 
And he calls me up on the phone. He's, ran, he's saying, well, you know, I'm picking you up at this time. And he's like, do you want a banana? And I was like, how did you know that? Like, he's, he's such an amazing scholar. He crosses so many borders in his own work. And he's always been so friendly and nice to everyone, no matter whether you're a graduate student or full professor. It didn't matter to Amrajit. And just, but even anticipating that I would want a banana, I was like, wow. This is great. This is amazing. So I want to thank everybody. Um, also, I want to thank um, the people who were here today putting this together, Winsome, um, Joe Shields for the introduction, all the graduate students I met with last night for dinner and over lunch, which was really fun, uh, Linda Z, Linda R, um, pre the president, um, Dwayne Nellis, and um, all the different financial sponsors, because I know this is a hard thing sometimes to get sponsorship. So I really appreciate that. Um, so, um, I have the slide here for the Langston Hughes inaugural lecture in honor of Amrijit. And um, I am, uh, I did decide to put a picture of Amrijit into my PowerPoint. Um, this is a lecture in on honor of him. And this <laughs> funny quote, which does tie into crossing borders. Um, when I first typed this into the PowerPoint, I was showing it to my partner. He said, it's, um, he's, he read it, and he looked at me in a strange way, and it said, he said, does, is I'm rigid in love with trans? And I was like, what? And I had left out the eye. And, but it kind of worked with the idea of trans and crossing boundaries and borders. And I was like, look, no, why do you think he, anyway. So I had to put the eye back in. But this is a, about crossing borders via train. So I thought it was a very appropriate photo. Um, and so here's the title of my talk today, uh, Henry Box Brown, The Many Lives of Crossing Borders, The Many Lives of Henry Box Brown. And I'm going to tell you today a story of a man and his box. And so um, the box, I'm going to tell you a story about Henry Box Brown. Um, it's a story about a man and a box, but it's also a story about a man who is constantly escaping from his box. Um, he's constantly getting out of this box. And he's also constantly dismantling the many boxes into which he is placed in a trickster-like fashion. And this reminded me a lot of Langston Hughes, and I want to have at least one slide about Langston Hughes, because this is a Langston Hughes inaugural lecture. Um, but Brown was a man who was constantly crossing boundaries and borders, and also deconstructing them. And, and, and I will talk about this more later in the talk, this idea of how he was deconstructing borders. Um, but it does seem appropriate that this is the first in the Langston Hughes inaugural lecture. Um, because I do th see really clear connections to Langston Hughes. And um, to note just one, um, I will eventually talk about a slippage between the real Henry Box Brown and the persona he creates. And this does remind me of Langston Hughes a little bit with the Jesse B. Sample stories. Um, we know that Langston Hughes published um, sketches with this character Jesse B. Sample, uh, also known as Simple. And, and I'm sure many of you know this, but he reached many people through this character of Sample, who is a kind of a, he's kind of a poor man who lives in Harlem, he's kind of a comic no good, as, and, he, and Hughes uses this stereotype in really interesting ways. Within these stories, he tells his, um, his, his adventures to Boyd, who is a writer who is very much like Langston Hughes. So you can see we already have, in Jesse B. Sample, a writer who is very similar. Uh, he, we have Langston Hughes. We have a writer within the stories who may or may not be Langston Hughes. But then there's this interesting connection that people always talk about Langston Hughes and his verse as simple. When I bring in my, uh, and critics do that too, when I, when I bring in his poems to my class, students always say, I love his poems because they're so simple. And they're not. They are and they aren't. They're deceptively simple. So is Langston Hughes simple in some way? And is simple Langston B. Hughes? So there's the really interesting slippage there between the autobiographical person, the real person, the persona he creates um, within the text, and then the character of Simple himself. So I thought that ties into Henry Box Brown and what I'm going to be saying about him later. So um, Henry Box Brown, who I will be talking about today, is also a trickster and a border crosser, and one who uses alter egos to conflate and confound boundaries between the real self, whoever that is, and the artistic persona he creates in his, in his writing and in his performance work. Uh, but before I talk about Brown, I'll just say a tiny bit about myself as a border crosser. Um, and um, Amrija asked me to highlight just a little bit about my own work. And he already mentioned I have these three different books on different subjects, so they're border crossing. 
um, and my latest one, and they, they cover different ethnic groups, and uh, this latest book is border crossing in the sense that I have African American and Anglo American writers, but I also have British and American, so there's a lot of border crossing going on in that book, um, and crossing between the visual and the performance and the literary and all that. Um, so there's that with my books, and I'm rigid, I think maybe mentioned this, but I also do a lot of work on a writer called Sui Sin Far, which I know some of the graduate students are reading, oh, I can't go away from the mic, um, in, the, in the class that they have, are taking with um, Rigit. She was the first Asian American writer, one of the earliest Asian American writers in the United States, and published a volume called Mrs. Spring Fragrance in 1912. And there's a picture of her and of her book. Um, so um, she, as you can probably guess, was uh, multi-ethnic. Her father was uh, British and her mother was Chinese, not Chinese, well, eventually Chinese American, but came from China. And um, one of the things I've done in my work with Sui Sin Far is to theorize this idea of border crossing and borders themselves. Um, but she has characters who cross borders from um, Asian to uh, American or white, um, back to Asian, and sometimes back to white. Also characters who cross, they cross dress and they cross from male to female and sometimes back. And also they cross borders from Canada to the United States and even into other countries. So she's a really interesting border crosser. And via her work, I've raised this question several times. The, the crossing of the border back and forth, does that mean the, bird, the border becomes permeable? That it becomes a space of change and transformation rather than a hard and fast line drawn into the sand, which I will come back to in a minute. But I think she's a really interesting writer from that point of view um, with the crossing of the borders. And another uh, border crossing subject that I've taken on is the question of racial passing. And um, I work on racial passing, and um, one of the things I've asked with that is when you have an individual who is African-American but light-skinned who can pass for white and does, does that undermine the idea of race itself as a construct? Um, because if you can cross back and forth from black to white, does that mean that those categories are irrelevant or they don't mean something physically or they don't mean something scientifically. But then with passing, there's also a question in the sense of an individual sometimes has to pick. I'm going to be one thing. I'm not gonna be able to be in this middle ground. And so then that may reify the borders. So that's a question I've asked about racial passing. I have up here this great picture of Walter White. Um, Walter White was, he called himself a voluntary Negro. And he um, identified as African American and was part of an African American family, but he would pass into whiteness in order to investigate lynching. And he would get all the details of horrific lynchings and write them down and publish them. And he almost lost his life on more than one occasion for this type of passing because people would be saying, oh, we're, we hear that Walter White's coming to town and we're gonna lynch him if we get our hands on him. So he, he crosses over into whiteness to challenge um, racial, uh, to challenge lynching and to collect details and crosses back into blackness. So I've written a lot on racial passing and I'm happy to talk about that. And I do actually come back to that topic later in the presentation with Henry Box Brown. So it all comes back around in circles in really interesting ways. Um, so um, we already talked about Mela, so I'll skip this slide. Um, I've theorized the border a bit in my own writing, and um, there are two separate definitions of the border. Uh, I think if you look at the slide I have here, um, I've, um, I've, one of the things I've asked is, um, wh what do we mean when we talk about the border itself? Is it this line that we think about? And if you look at the meanings of the border that I have up here, there are separate meanings. Um, one being uh, a line separating two political or geographical areas. And so we have that as just this line. But then another definition is the edge or boundary of something or the part near it. And synonyms are margin, perimeter, circumference, periphery. So you can already see the idea of the border is expanding and it becomes this really interesting liminal space, a space of possibly change and transformation. And of course, I have to have a slide here um, for Gloria Anzaldúa, who really has theorized the border quite a bit from her fabulous work, Borderlands La Frontiera. And she talks in this work um, about the borderlands as the region between Texas and Mexico, um, where she was born, 
and raised exactly in the geographical space where political legitimacy and illegitimacy is displaced in t is disputed on the basis of language and skin color. The borderlands represent a space of pain, but also limina liminality and transformation, I think, from which she will try to forge a new mestizo consciousness. So the borderlands can be a space for things to change in productive ways. And I think theorizing the border is really important now. We have a crisis at our borders and we have um, ideas of the borders as a firm line in the sand and we're gonna build a wall. It's a really important time, as I'm sure you all know, to theorize the border space. We have these lines being drawn all the time and families being separated in crisis at the border. So I think it's really important to think about the borders not as this hard and fast wall that we're all gonna build, but as a productive space for change and transformation and get away from this idea of the border, something that keeps people out and other people in. So um, getting back to Henry Box Brown um, and the kinds of borders he crosses, because he was also a really interesting border crosser, I thought I'd put up here this, um, a slide, so who is Henry Box Brown? I thought I'd put a slide up about his real border crossing, and this is a passenger manifest I discovered um, uh, when he came to the back to the United States in 1875 with his family, a real border crossing on board the ship, the Algiers, which was traveling from Liverpool back to the United States. And um, you can see he's traveling with his wife um, he's referred to as Professor H. Box Brown, his wife, Annie, and his two children. And so an, an example of a real border crossing that he did when he came back to the United States. Um, but this was certainly not the only one. So who was Henry Box Brown for those of you? How many people have heard of him before? Henry Box Brown. Cool, that's great, that's great. I'm glad people are starting to hear about him. So um, a lot of people know about the early part of his life. He was an enslaved man who in 1849 in Richmond, Virginia, um, bought a large postal crate. He had money because he had been um, working as a tobaccoist. And he bought a large postal crate and marked it this side up, with handle with care. And he got into it and he had it shipped to Philadelphia. And it took about 36 hours and it was received there by members of the Underground Railroad. And he, and he came out alive. He was turned on his head a few times, so it was quite painful. But he survived, and he got out of the box, and he promenaded singing a song he'd written for this occasion of his escape. So he was a real showman, um, to say the least. Um, this was definitely one of the most spectacular escapes of the antebellum period, and it was quickly celebrated in both pictures and songs about him. And here's a picture. Oh, I'm sorry, we went over that already. Um, sorry, here's a picture of Brown, uh, a lithograph from 1850 of him jumping out of the box. And this is supposed to be Frederick Douglass, I believe. Frederick Douglass actually was not there. So, um, you know, that's, that's a problem. Um, and I forget who else, but he's, you know, it's, it's called the resurrection of Henry Box Brown. It's this rebirth into freedom and into a new identity, supposedly. Um, and it was, it was really, people uh, were really excited by this escape. He became a famous anti-slavery orator. He toured the United States and England, in England as well, in 1850. And he had this moving panorama about slavery, which were these large vertical scrolls, like huge, this, like this big, as tall as I am, which uh, granted is not very tall, as we've established here today. Thank you, Amrit. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, you know, these really, they were probably like, you know, four feet, t five feet scrolls and, and pictures, paintings, and they were sewn together and, 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 he, and they were on this big scroll and he would unwind them and he would be the narrator, what was called the delineator of this panorama, which was a popular 1850s version of going to the movies, I guess you might say. Um, and there were scenes of his escape and scenes having to do with slavery and lynching and other things like that. And this was very popular. It was called Henry Box Brown's Mirror of Slavery. Um, and his escape was celebrated visually by way of several engraved broadsides. You, this is one of them, um, a lithograph rather, but there were also broadsides, and the broadsides uh, had his song on them. So he was multimedia performance. He had the song, he had, he had the panorama, he had his own speeches, and he also had narratives. He was on Facebook. And, no, he wasn't on Facebook. <laughs> If there was Twitter that, th he would have been tweeting. I know he would have like been like on Twitter all the time. Um, but um, yeah, and he had, um, he had two narratives of his life were published. The first one was in 1849, and um, it, it was published by a man named, and probably written by a man named Charles Stern, 
and Brown was a co-author on it. We don't know if he knew how to read or write then, um, but it was uh, in 1849, and, and this is the frontispiece. It was called Narrative of Henry Box Brown, who escaped from slavery um, in, enclosed in a box three feet long and two feet wide, and that was 1849. And I really hate this picture of him he looks sort of um, slovenly and complacent, and this is his first kind of appearance into the visual culture of the United States. So I'm not too happy about that this picture, and I don't actually think he was. So then he ended up going to England in 1850. His um, master sent people to try to take him back into slavery, and because of the fugitive slave law, that was legal. So his master sent some people, and there was a fist fight, and he was injured. So he fled to England in 1850. And he published an 1851 narrative, and I like this picture much better. Uh, this is the frontispiece to the 1851 edition, um, which was called Narrative of the Life of Henry Box Brown, written by himself. And that was published in England in 1850. So um, I like this picture much better. It seems more active, and he's escaping from the box. He's pushing himself up. And there's wonder and amazement in it at his miraculous escape. Um, Brown continued to perform as a singer, actor, magician, um, and mesmerist, which is an 1850, 1870 version of hypnotist, and um, in England, and also electrobiologist, and several other things uh, he did. In England, the United States, and Canada, well into the early 1890s, so the guy lived a really long time. He was born in 1817 or 1819, 1817 or 1818, and he lived till 1897. Um, I would argue that Brown takes a somewhat different approach to the visual rhetoric that his escape and he himself produce. He crafts a constantly mutating, constantly transforming icon that finally cannot be contained by any one text or by any one reading of himself. So he's a bit of a trickster and a showman, but I think that's to try to escape from the way uh, you know, people are trying to box him into this one image of himself. Brown's visual persona refuses to be immobilized or imprisoned, but rather multiplies itself endlessly in a series of magical transformations. And they're, they're quite startling at times. You come across some advertisement, I'm like, wait, what's he doing here? Faith healing, exposing spiritualism, it's, it gets very odd. So I'll give you a few examples of these, and then I'll come back to something I recently discovered about him. Um, these performances are great. Um, this is one from the Leeds Time in England in 1851, and it says, great attraction caused in England by Mr. Henry Box Brown, a fugitive slave who made his escape from Richmond in Virginia, packed up in a box, three feet, one inch long by two feet, and two feet, six inches. Mr. Brown will leave Brantford for Leeds on Thursday next at six o'clock p.m., accompanied by a band of music, packed up in the identical box, arriving in Leeds by half past six, then forming a procession through the principal streets to the music hall, uh, Albion Street, where Mr. Brown will be released from the box, the audience, and then give the particulars of his escape from slavery, also the song of his escape. He will then uh, show the great panorama of American slavery, which has been exhibited in the country to thousands. Uh, you know, so he's a master of multimedia here. He's doing all kinds of things. He would also sell his narrative, so we've got, the, we've got the print, we've got the songs, we've got the visual, a lot going on, and this being released on stage in front of a live audience is totally fascinating. Um, I have some other performances I'm gonna skip because I know you guys have been here for a long time, and uh, I'm gonna um, skip this one, um, which is interesting. He performed a lot of different panoramas. Um, I wanna go back, let's see, let's see. Not this one. Um, we have a lot of different panoramas. I'm not going to talk about those. Um, but I'm going to go th to this one from The Error from 1857. So he started being an actor as well on stage. And um, this is from an, a London newspaper, The Error, in 1857. Mr. Henry Box Brown, proprietor of the Great American Panorama, will, in a very short time, make his appearance on the stage of the London Theater, first appearing in three new dramas, the Fugitive Free, The Nubian Captive, or Royal Slave, and, and these are plays by E.G. Burton. He didn't write these, as far as we know. And Pocahontas, or The English Tar and the Indian Princess. Uh, oh, sorry, I put the wrong, I put the wrong slide up there. There we go. 
uh, Pocahontas, uh, or The English Tar and the Indian Apprentice, all of which dramas have never yet been brought before the public. So these are dramas that he wrote with, he didn't write them, but E.G. Burton wrote with him because as I'll talk about, they're fairly autobiographical in some very strange ways. So E.G. Burton would have had to collaborate with Brown on these dramas. Um, so he's actually an actor at this point, and we know that these plays were performed in 1857, both in London and in a town called Margate. Um, there's also some suspicion that he might have been writing plays. I haven't confirmed this, so I'm just gonna throw that out there. I don't really know, I'm still thinking about it. But you can see a couple, uh, these are related, I think, to the, the performances I just mentioned around the same time. Um, Royal Park Theater, Mr. Brown has secured the servants of Mr. Henry Box Brown, the well-known escaped slave and public lecturer, who will make the fir his first essay on the boards as an actor, as a, as a piece, any piece written especially for the introduction of the most stirring scenes in his eventful life. We shall then have the rare occurrence of a hero personifying himself. So he's playing himself. I'll also argue he's playing with the materials of his life in a really interesting way. Um, it's possible he was writing plays, and I haven't confirmed this, and you can see this in the second advertisement I put up. This could be a mistake, I'm not really sure. We haven't necessarily found any plays he's written, but it says, Mr. Brown, having established, there's a long description of his life, and that says, and this is from 1857 as well, having established the merits and truth of his exhibition by the unanimous verdict of all the free states of American nation, visited this country and exhibited to Englishmen with all adjuncts of scenery and description the greatest system of crime and tyranny that was ever engulfed of the social status of the world, slavery. But it is not simply as a demonstration that Mr. Brown comes amongst us, but in the dual capacity of dramatist and actor. That's really interesting, dramatist and actor. So is he writing plays? I don't know, I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, so, and again, this phrase, um, him being the hero of one of his own pieces. So that's kind of interesting. So um, he continues, and, and keep this in mind, his acting in these plays, I'm gonna come back to that. Um, he continues to perform um, different kinds of things, panoramas, um, in this particular panorama, um, from this is from 1859, and we actually, I didn't find this, I can't claim to find it, but we found a poster, um, which is really cool, of his performance in Shrewsbury, England in 1859. And um, it's really interesting, he's now taken on a different persona as well. He's calling himself a native prince. Mr. H. Brock Brown will appear in his dress as a native prince. So um, that's kind of fascinating. And he also has another persona that he calls the African chief. And um, this is in an advertisement from the Preston Guardian in 1861. And it says, um, uh, Miss, uh, it, says um, it says, during, okay, so the, it says, um, panorama of slavery, the panorama of slavery exhibited by Mr. Henry Box Brown closed in Brunley on the evening. During his stay, Mr. Brown, who is a man of color, attracted considerable attention. On several occasions, he paraded the streets dressed as an African chief. <laughs> and Mr. Box Brown occasionally, and Mrs. Box Brown, so he would perform with his wife, perform with his wife Annie. Um, and she, Mrs. Box Brown occasionally described her panorama of the Holy Land. I feel like I should dance. It would be, it would be appropriate yeah. for Henry Box Brown. I'll just do, okay. Um, and presents, presents were also given away towards the close of his stay. So interesting he would perform in that way. Um, so also, if that's not enough, so the guy's an actor, and he's got this panorama, and he's parading the streets uh, dressed as an African prince. Um, he was a mesmerist, as I mentioned. So he would hypnotize people. And so there's um, a, a notice in 1867 in the Cardiff Times reporting that Brown was having great success in England with his lectures on the subject of mesmerism and electrobiology. And electrobiology in that time period was, all, was called animal magnetism. And it was also a kind of hypnosis, supposedly. Um, in England, Brown worked with a very well-known mesmerist known as Chadwick, who possessed one account said, a most wonderful influence of all who submitted themselves to his operation. This is Chadwick. He sent them to sleep, awoke them, made them jump about transfixed to their chairs, 
At his command, they were riveted to the platform from which they could not move unless commanded to so by the operation. They jumped, they danced, they rang imaginary bell, rolled about, held one leg in the air as long as the mesmerizer chose, and then they were all sent to sleep again. So he's performing mesmerism, and in England, this would probably be white audiences predominantly, and he'd be hypnotizing them. So it's kind of fascinating that a man who once was a slave is now got an audience totally under his control and is forcing him to essentially be his slave, at least for some period of time. So um, oh, he is also performing magic in England and um, also back in the United States. So he comes back to the United States in 1875. You already saw the slide with his wife and two children. And we have a really interesting poster from his, one of his performances of magic in the United States, and this is in Worcester in, in, I think, 1875. I think I did pin down that date. And it's a great poster. You can see there's a lot going on. You've got his wife doing mysterious second sight performance. You've got spiritualism exposed. But you've also got him doing magic. And partially what he's doing with this magic is he's playing this with the symbols of his own enslavement. Like he's got a box and he's destroying it. And he's also, he would do as part of his magic act, sometimes he would have himself shackled up and a curtain would be drawn and that would be pulled up and he'd be out of the shackles. So he's playing with these symbols of his own enslavement, the box, the shackles. But there's a lot going on that he's doing here that's really fascinating. The box, the way you would use a box to disappear is there would be mirrors in it. So, and, if, and you'd spin it and they, if you didn't do it just right, the audience might see themselves in that box. So it's again, it's kind of making the audience part of his performance in a really interesting way. So he was doing magic, um, especially later in his life um, in the United States. He was also in Canada. Um, this is from 1882, um, the London, Ontario. So this is Canada, London, Ontario. Um, appearing, in, it says, there's an advertisement that says, Professor Box Brown appeared in the town hall last night and obtained leave to address the council. He related the thrilling scenes and incidents connected with his escape from slavery, et cetera, packed in a box. And he wanted the use of the hall for one of these lectures, and if so granted, would expose conjuring, give an exhibition of legerdemain, which, um, uh, which is magic, and would lecture on animal magnetism, biology, sociology, trichology, and mycology. And I believe the last two, mycology is the use of mushrooms for healing. So there's some sort of healing going on here, too. The use of the hall was granted. Yay, can you imagine? They were probably scared of him at this point. Like, OK, <laughs> we better give this guy use of the hall. <laughs> but it even gets better. Um, there is uh, another advertisement. I'm not going to read it in the sake of time, but it's right up here at the top. It says um, he wants to give a lecture on mesmerism and a free invite to the members of the council who he would undertake to mesmerize individually or collectively. It's like, okay, you let me use this hall or I'm gonna mesmerize you right now and you're gonna be sorry because you're gonna be barking like dogs and rolling around on the stage. <laughs> so this is pretty fascinating. The last performance that we've been able to find from Brown is from 1889 and this is also a really interesting one. Um, and it's in Brantford, Canada. So it says, last evening, Professor Brown and family gave one of their unique entertainments at the YMCA, YMCA location to a fair audience. First, Professor Brown told uh, us about slavery and his escape from the slave scouts to Philadelphia in a box. Yeah, we, can, we know that by now. He then proceeded to give a number of feats of legerdemain. I can never say that word. Legerdemain. There we go. Legerdemain. Again, those are mag magic tricks of the usual order after which the company rendered a number of plantation songs which were well appreciated by those present. The ladies, so he's performing now with Annie, his daughter, and his wife. The ladies were very good singers and there was more plantation energy than usual in such entertainment. The professor stated at the close that a number of gentlemen in the city were anxious to, give, to have him give a lecture on slavery and to do so in about two weeks. So he's lecturing, he's singing, he's performing, uh, he's doing magic. Um, so there's a lot going on. Um, he died in 1897, and um, I was the first person to document that he died in Toronto in 1897. Nobody really 100% knew what happened to him, but I was able to sleuth that out, and there's a picture of his gravestone. And now we know the last decade of his life, he was living in Toronto, and he was teaching, Matt, he was still teaching, he was teaching music, um, and uh, I don't know if he was performing after 1889. 
Um, but you can see already that there's a lot of border crossing going on in terms of his performances. He's crossing between different performance modes, narrative, panoramas, mesmerism, maybe a playwright, an actor. And there's also this really interesting crossing between um, being a fictional and a factual self. And I'm gonna talk about that really briefly in the remaining time I have. I don't wanna go on too long because I know many of you have been here for a long time, but. And we have time for a few more. Right, right, till 5.30? Oh, okay, no, I, I, I don't need that. Oh, I don't need all the men. I, I, I kept this part. So this is all new material, and I'm really happy to talk about it. But I'm working with this idea of Henry Rox Brown's auto impersonation. Um, I recently discovered and transcribed the script of three, the three plays that he was acting in in England in 1857. And um, two of them are actually autobiographical in some ways with his life. The Fugitive Free and the Nubian Prince are autobiographical in some ways with his life. As I mentioned, the plays are written by E.G. Burton, who's a fairly minor British playwright, but Brown collaborated closely with them, and they mirror details of his life in some ways, and only things that he would have known, like names of his family and stuff like that. Um, no one has ever looked at these plays as far as I can tell, and no one has written about them, so I'm quite excited about that and sharing this today, and I'm Rigid for letting me talk about this. Um, in the remaining time, I'm gonna tell you really briefly about why these plays are so interesting, especially in light of my theme of crossing borders and the many lives of Henry Box Brown. In brief, the plays are autobiographical to his life. He actually, in one of them, plays himself. Um, the character is called Henry Brown. So I get the play and there's no list of who's playing what part. And I'm like, how am I gonna know who's Henry Brown? And then the two characters are talking about like, oh, who shall we free? It's the slave owner and his daughter, Amelia. And, and the daughter's like, I want to free Henry Brown. And I'm like, I guess Henry Brown's playing Henry Brown. That's not hard to figure out. And then all the names match up with his family names, too, which is really fascinating. Um, they feature the wife, the name of his first wife, Nancy, and his separation from her. So he was trying to buy her out of slavery, Nancy Brown. And she, they had three children, and she was pregnant with the fourth child when the, he had given some money to the guy who owned her and the guy just abruptly sold him off, sold Nancy off and the three children. And he, and he had to escort her. He wasn't allowed to go to the jail. He had to escort, he could only escort her as she was marched off in a coffin with his three children. So they're autobiographical in featuring the sale of his wife and his children. Um, and, um, um, and his own, he escapes by box in The Fugitive Free again different than what happened in real life, but he escapes by box. There's a box and he's packed into it and sent north. Um, but they're also not autobiographical in some ways. For example, one of them, The Fugitive Free, features a really long and spectacular scene of a slave auction in which Brown himself is auctioned off. And Brown was never auctioned off that we know of. Um, he escaped from slavery, he wasn't auctioned. Um, and there's a long auction scene. It goes on for a long time with many bids on Henry Box Brown. Um, and in another play, which is called The Nubian Captive, Brown is sold into slavery, um, and he has to pass as a sailor. And he ends up saving his wife, who is also enslaved. And we know in real life, as far as we know, he was never able to go back and get Nancy and save her. And um, he had to abandon her. And so that is not autobiographical. And as far as we know, um, that did not happen. So he plays himself in these dramas, but he also plays himself. He passes for himself in really interesting ways. He uses the raw material of his life. I call these plays acts of auto-impersonation because in effect, Brown is impersonating himself. Normally we impersonate another person. Like, I'm gonna do my impersonation of I'm in it now, whatever. But you don't normally impersonate yourself. <laughs> I have to get like two feet taller as we've already established. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know. So what are we to make of Brown's roles in these plays? And also, strangely, willingly subjecting himself to the gaze of a British audience as an enslaved man while he was legally free in England. We know that slavery had been abolished in England where he was living, so he's legally free and he's re-enslaving himself. In what ways might the spectacle enchain Brown once again in the social death of slavery? In what ways might this re-performance of his own enslavement and escape become a mode of liberation precisely via spectacle itself? Brown was the star of these plays, and I argue in them that Brown engages in a type of auto-impersonation by incorporating but also revising aspects of his own life 
the plays depict Brown becoming not only the hero of the play, but also the hero of his own life, which he probably wasn't able to be entirely um, in terms of what really happened to him. In the longer version of this, t of this uh, material, I argue that by allowing himself to be objectified through spectacle, Brown seeks to escape the psychic death of slavery. He's able to create a sort of performance, performative second skin that houses his persona, but also releases him. I argue that by exercising a mode of dark surveillance and counter visuality of looking from below and looking back at his audience in these plays, Brown comes to exercise both visual and psychic power over slavery. Perhaps by turning slavery itself into a toy, a prop, a spectacle, Brown in effect embraces objectification and in so doing finds a mode of subjectivity, of human identity. He impersonates himself in order to re-embody and reenact his human identity. My larger argument beyond Brown's fascinating roles in these plays has to do with how his performance work departs from that of other fugitives. While it might seem that Brown is simply an extension of a certain performative mode that was latent and more dignified individuals such as Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass, who I'm sure as many of you, you know, use their photographs to um, create images of themselves as literate and free and dignified. In the case of Frederick Douglass, we have hundreds of portraits of him, photographs of him, and he never smiles. He wanted people to think of him as the lion, as a very serious persona. Um, I argue that with Brown, his activism via the spectacle highlights a more unruly performative strain latent in abolitionist discourse. Um, Brown becomes an escape artist who attempts to overturn scopic regimes such as um, master versus slave, white versus black, and free versus captive that subtend not only slavery, but racial objectification as a whole. I did have a slide about that. There we go. Well, I'll go back to this anyway. Let's go back to this one. Um, so I'm going to talk really briefly about The Fugitive Free, which is the most autobiographical. Um, this play even uses Brown's name, as I have mentioned, and the name of several of his relatives. His wife, Nancy, appears in the play, and his sister, Jane. And the play is set near Richmond, Virginia, and which is close to where Brown lived and escaped. Brown, Brown plays himself, but I'm, as I mentioned, but he also plays or passes for himself, um, and in that not everything in the play actually happened to him, and I've explained that already. The actor Henry Brown ghosts the real Henry Box Brown, but also complicates whether the real Henry Box Brown can be known, and in, 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 um, in this way, the spectacle of his performance is enhanced. The play invokes many tropes common to slave narrative, including Brown's own, However, when we look at Brown's stage, the staging of Brown's persona, um, it becomes clear that he's undermining a lot of the binaries we normally think of in terms of um, this dichotomy of empowered white free individual and disempowered black and slave persona. Um, and this is um, the very first page of the pl play. Well, it's not the first page. It's where Brown appears. This is what it looked like when I got this uh, as a, uh, I think I had to, bribe some library somewhere to uh, like to to do a PDF of it for me because it's never been transcribed and um, Then I got this in the mail and I was like, oh dear I'm a tw 19th 20th century Americanist. I'm not used to this So I did transcribe it, but you can see the title there the fugitive free and then this is the the first place where Brown shows up in the play and he's just learned that he's gonna be free so he's saying oh mother mother I, I'm we're, we're gonna be free um, uh, and so that's really interesting um, that he's playing himself. Um, but um, it does undermine a number of binaries in the play as a whole. Um, uh, some of these binaries are empowered, white, free, over disempowered, black, and uh, enslaved. It crosses those borders. Just to give you one example and one scene, David. And David is a white British man. And the play is set in Richmond, Virginia, so in, in the 1850s. And I'm like, well, how did this guy, why is there a white British man <laughs> floating around in this play? It's, it's really odd. But anyway, um, he's, um, David, this white British man, is able to pass for Henry Brown. And Henry Brown passes for David. Um, because they need to get him out of jail. He's been sold, and his new owner is getting ready to take him away. So David goes into jail and they switch clothes and David is and David lies on the bed where Henry is 
And Henry puts on David's clothes and you know, covers up his face. And I think in one scene, I think David has even gone into blackface at that point. Um, so he'll be taken for Henry Box Brown. Um, so David passes for Henry Box Brown and vice versa so that um, Henry Box Brown can get out of jail. And this part I have transcribed, it's not really all that helpful, but this is the actual pass where they change clothes and, um, and, and Henry gets out of jail and David stays in jail until they discover that it's really David and he's not a slave and he's not Henry Box Brown. It's kind of a crazy play, what can I say, but it's fun. Um, so racism and even race itself may be challenged by the play's tropes of masking, passing, and racial transformation. There's a lot of masking and passing and racial transformation going on in these plays. David actually passes twice for a black man, once to get a note to Nancy, and then later in the play to Free Brown, crossing back and forth between whiteness and blackness. And in so doing, he suggests, I think, that the boundaries between the races are permeable and porous, and that they can be crossed and perhaps undermined rather than fixed and absolute. In the moment when David passes for Henry, many kinds of borders are crossed and perhaps undermined, black versus white, enslaved versus free, English versus American, and so on, at least temporarily. In consenting to become David, at least for a while, and to be reboxed later in the play, we can also see Henry, the character, and Brown, the man, assenting to a kind of performative identity, a kind of second skin, a self-passing. Consider also that throughout the play, Brown is really passing for himself, he both is and isn't the character he plays. So it's weird when a person plays themselves in a play. That's already weird. But then he's also playing a self that's not really himself. He's playing a simulacrum of himself. I don't, I'm not sure how to describe it. But when David passes for Brown here, he's also passing for something that really isn't Brown either. So it's, it's very strange. Um, so what, I, what I'm getting at is there's no true self for Brown in this play, but rather a series of mutating identities that I think undermine the boundaries, of, uh, not only of enslavement, but also categories of identity as a whole. You may end up getting very confused about who's doing what, and that's part of the point. Um, Brown is not exactly the hero of the play, but he remains really its unknowable, unknowable and unknown center as he wears the second skin of both a white man and a black man, a slave and a free man, and an actor and a quote unquote real man. So I asked myself, actor, singer, playwright, mesmerist, entertainer, magician, white man, black man, fugitive, free man, beggar man, thief, I don't know. I asked myself, will the real Henry Box Brown please stand up? And I think we've come really a long way from this first visual icon where he looks very flat and static. Um, we've come really far from this. I think that Brown's plural selves keep open the play of his own identity and his status and culture. And I think that's why there's a real plasticity to him. He's really hard to pin down. He's very slippery on his persona. And I think that's why he's really been interested in, uh, of interest to a number of African-American artists. Some of you may know um, Glenn Lee Gunn's performance work. There's another guy, Wilmer Wilson, who has a whole Henry Box Brown act where he, he dresses in, in stamps and has them peeled off as he walks around DC and asks to be mailed to freedom. But Glenn Lee Gunn has this wonderful installation called To Disembark, and he's got the boxes, and he's also got one lithograph on the wall that shows the portrait of Henry Box Brown. So, um, and the boxes are marked right side up with care, which is interesting. Brown is always crossing borders, and he, I think that's why it's difficult to capture him or box him in. He's ceaselessly escaping. So in conclusion, what, what, what can we learn from all of this? I think um, one thing um, is that identity is always changing. It's never static and stable. And all of us, hopefully, in our scholarship, in our work, in our lives, and we will cross many borders and in and out, in, in and out of many different selves. And I think that's healthy. And I think it is important to open ourselves to, the, to border crossing and to be open to border crossers. Um, don't build a wall. I had to put that in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> don't, please. Um, but accept the border crosser. Immigrants, migrants, passers, everyone, ourselves. We are a nation of immigrants and border crossers, and that really has made us stronger and accept this. But also, I think it's really important to think about the border as this space of change and possibility, which is within us, that we have this cha change and possibility. Um, think of the border as a space of possibility, change, and transformation, and the space for the creation of a new mestizo border crossing consciousness. Thank you.
Thank you. I'm Robin Muhammad, Chair of the Department of African American Studies. We have some time for a little Q&A from uh, Dr. Cutter's very fine presentation. Um, and then we will, after the, the Q&A, we will cross the border into the reception. <laughs> so, uh, are there any questions? Please raise your hands. We want to hear from you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so Linda's asking about uh, Brown's resting place. Um, well, I had a suspicion he was, he died in Toronto from just some things that I'd come across. So I got in touch with a person I know who's a scholar in, in um, Toronto, and she had moved, but she gave me the name of a very nice historian. And she and I, she said, I think Brown sued Toronto General Hospital in 1890. And I'm like, yeah, that's my guy. So we were able to establish that he was in Toronto in that year. And from there, you know, we kind of had his dates and everything. From there, it wasn't really that hard to search the cemetery records because Necropolis is a very well-known cemetery and they keep very good records. And then, you know, had to go for a trip with my camera. My partner, Peter Linehan, probably took that photo that's in there, you know, of the grave. So it was kind of like just like asking. I, I said this at lunch today, or at, no, in the morning class. It was kind of just like asking around and hoping somebody, and um, Heather Murray was the historian in Toronto who, that people, lots of people were really excited because they were like, oh, Brown was in Toronto, so lots of people, she contacted a lot of people, but she was the first one to realize he sued Toronto General Hospital, and from there, we were able, we still haven't found an obituary, which will be really helpful, but yeah, so kind of by asking and luck and sleuthing, but I did have that hunch because I'd read some stuff about performances he was doing in the Toronto area, so I had the idea he must be living there. So yeah, um, yeah, Amrit. Oh, yeah. sorry. Oh, well, uh, I, I'm working with a retired professor who just moved here two years ago from Virginia. Oh, cool. Working on a slave project that he's been working on since 1989. Um, and it's a clear approach, not in his this research but others, that you know slaves were considered animals. Mm -hmm. they were Yeah, so the question has to do with how Brown incorporated this everlasting grief and loss he felt into his plays. And I love that reading of that. Um, and I think there's one notice where Brown says, Brown claims, there's a letter where Brown claims that he tried to contact his wife's master and buy her and when he was in England. And his, the master said, absolutely no way, she's my mistress now. So we don't know if that's true or not. Because, and then there's also somebody who didn't like Brown who wrote, oh, he had all this money. He never tried to buy his wife out of slavery. I don't think he ever had a lot of money. So, but, but whatever. He didn't go back to the U.S. until 1875. And so I think, yeah, I mean, there's the I think what you're saying is there's a constant attempt to, like, it's that primal scene of trauma that he's constantly trying to, like, remake but also escape but maybe never it's repetitive it's kind of circular yeah and circling around it because you know the somebody emailed me recently and asked do you think he was really still performing with his original box in like 1888 i'm like no i don't think so but but he was using a box in his later performances and that was his claim to fame but it also might have been it's both his death the death of the slave henry box brown and maybe like in a certain like psychic death of his family in a way because he's not able to get them back, but also then a rebirth into some other identity that's going to try to keep circling around that. So it's interesting. Dr. Kinkley, do you have a question? Thank you very much. What would you say to it, um, Brown, with the Toronto Journal Hospital? Yeah. 
Yeah, um, I'm thinking about that. I, I have not, not to, so the question has to do with Brown's connection with other African American performers. And the thing that's really interesting to me is the way Brown keeps control. He doesn't seem to work with other people. He doesn't have a manager, he doesn't have a showman. So I think that's interesting that he keeps control. But I think, you know, he was singing. You saw that in one of the advertisements. And so there's a lot of going on like with the, with the, with singing and um, the Fisk singers and, uh, they were, yeah, they were, yeah, yeah. So they, yeah. So um, I, I also have at least one um, indication that he might have been doing some minstrel work, and I'm not, and that, and that whole thing about the plantation singers, I think, is is really fascinating. Um, the plantation music, and I'm not really quite sure what to do with that. Um, and to keep, I mean, I, I haven't really been able to definitively narrow that down um and it it would fit in a certain sense of creating these alter egos but uh i i only have one notice that seems to indicate that so um does that answer your question well i think that what's important is that he was like me seeking the connection to the broad atlantic movement mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that, um, like I think of, I was thinking about him as a little bit like Josephine Baker, like he got a lot of fame in Europe that he didn't get in the United States. And there's a new book on Josephine Baker that does talk about this sort of second skin. It's by Anna Anlin Chang, and it's really interesting in terms of her creating this performative identity, like, you know, that she could manipulate and that giving her a certain amount of power. But also, I mean, Brown was using kind of these popular entertainment modes. And the other thing I was gonna say, I think Hazel Waters has a book and she talks about how, you know, Orinoco, the Royal Prince, the performance, people were taking that very seriously until about 1850. And then after that, they were like, everything on the British stage was minstrelsy. And I think he complicates that narrative. Because these plays, although they're not the greatest plays in the world, they're definitely not minstrel plays. So he, he, he extends the time period in which serious drama about slavery was going on on the British stage. And I think that's important too. Oh yeah, yeah. Aldrich, I wrote Aldrich. Yeah, Aldrich. Yeah, that's one thing. And then uh, India comes into this. Yeah. That uh, movie about uh, Queen Victoria and uh, our folk and uh, Munshi. Yeah. Of course, uh, the British, the Britishers can't get over the nostalgia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's time to get moving on. Uh, but my two points are one on the, the collaboration thing. He's calling himself a playwright. I yeah. think what I That's think he did because uh, this Dramatist. minor uh, British playwright could not have done those plays without his collaboration. Right. So it's like uh, Wallace Sermon collaborating with the white American here. So of course Wallace Sermon was an extremely well-read person, very highly, you know, uh, this guy who could read 16 lines in one grand, one of the fastest readers. Yeah. But I would like to know if you have found anything of this white dramatist talking about the experience of collaboration. No, I haven't found anything about that. Yeah, um, there must be and I, the British Library would no, I, I've talked to the British Library, and I also since he performed in Margate, I've been trying to find out like if Margate had, what I would really like to find is ephemera related to those plays. Like there should be a poster somewhere, yeah. um, maybe a ticket. Um, 
and I and they say no. So I do need to get over to England though, because no. like we were talking about archives this morning. You you never know. You're in the archive looking. All of a sudden something just dropped out. I mean Cornell for some reason has a ticket to one of his panoramas that's signed by him. So it has a signature. I could probably compare that to the handwriting on the plate. No, I know. I mean, <laughs> I, it's not out of the stretch of imagination that he wrote plays by himself too, because you know he was multi-talented, obviously. And it's just I just don't know. I haven't actually found that to be the case yet. Um, Yeah. And this guy who wants to fight back through performance. And I was thinking of uh, that uh, famous speech in uh, Invisible Man. Mm. Uh, there's just so many yesing them to death, grilling them to death. Right, yesing them to death. We often don't understand that uh, there can be a whole variety of ways of fighting the battle. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What is it you're doing? So I think always, uh, whether it's a Palestinian struggle, uh, the African American struggle, yep. the varieties of uh, weaponry. Yeah. Including weaponry that includes getting people to death and beating people. Right. And humor. Yeah, and humor, humor can be. I was going to say, you, you guys, if you've never seen the Chappelle skit, Time Travelers. Yeah. He goes back in time to the days of slavery, and he sees his own relatives. And the guy's like, uh, he's Chappelle's saying, you're going to be free one day. And um, his relative says, well, when? And the master comes out, and he goes, well, how, what are you doing here? And, the, and Chappelle pulls out his pistol, and he says, well, how's about now? And he shoots the master. And you, it switches back to Chappelle, because I don't think they ever showed this, and Chappelle's laughing his ass off. And everybody else is laughing. He's like, I would shoot a slave owner on the show every day if I could. <laughs> and it's like it's real to him, and he's using humor in this really subversive, sarcastic way. And I think that might be this kind of radical, humorous performance, because some of this is funny, right? You know, It is like, oh, he's on stage. And some of it's very sad. I mean, it's also about the trauma of slavery. And you know, you, in the Chappelle skit, you see the individuals in the field being beaten. And, and yet it's like, oh, I'm going to use my weapon to kind of take power from this spectacle or take power over the spectacle. Um, Thaddeus, you had your hand up back there. and so forth become the forte of lots of, of different kinds of characters and especially um, they were of interest in England. So he's fitting into a particular kind of pattern. Yeah. That, um, But if you go through the performances, both in the U.S. and uh, abroad, of those kinds of plays in that period, you'll find correlation to the Brown work. Yeah. Um, so the, the panoramas, especially, were really, really popular in England. So Thaddeus is asking a little bit about the, the kind of ways in which Uncle Tom's Cabin became part of the performative scene in England. And in the United States, the panoramas were phenomenally popular in England. There were hundreds of these panoramas of Uncle Tom's Cabin. And so we, we were talking before the lecture about how I got interested, and I wanted a contrast to Uncle Tom's Cabin and the character of Topsy and, and Uncle Tom. And you know, um, and so I, I knew I was going to end the, my current book in 1852, and um, I was talking about Brown as this alternative to these somewhat flat, somewhat stereotypical characters. And then I found that in England, Brown was exhibiting his own panorama first, before Uncle Tom's Cabin came out. But then, given the popularity of Uncle Tom's Cabin, he also had a Uncle Tom's Cabin panorama. 
And I was like, oh, at first. And I was like, no, this goes with what I'm saying about this t taking control over these, um, you know, these kind of performances. And, you know, Guy had to earn his living. And you're, you're right, Uncle Tom's Cabin was so popular. There's a joke that some guy's walking along in England on a dark and stormy night, and um, he bumps into another guy, and he goes, what are you doing out on this horrible night? And he says, oh, I'm going to see an Uncle Tom's panorama. And the other guy goes, so am I. Which one are you going to? <laughs> there were so many of these panoramas. <laughs> like, they're really, like I said, it's like movies today. This is what people had. So, um, so yeah, so he uses that to his advantage. I haven't found a connection. I have found sometimes people get them confused because William Wells Brown had a panorama too. But that's a really interesting question, and I haven't, I have not found connections yet. And he, William Wells Brown, definitely. Much known. Yeah, and Brown, as far as I can tell, wasn't much of a collabor. I mean, he obviously collaborated with E.G. Burton, and that's unusual. But I, as far as I can tell, he got disconnected from the abolitionist circuit because they didn't like that he revealed his mode of escape. Problem number one. Then, you know, because now no, someone else tried it and was caught. And he might not even have been the first person to do it. Somebody else might have done it beforehand. There's some dispute. So that number one, the abolitionists were like, eh. And then number two, he was turning slavery. They felt it was not proper, not dignified to be turning slavery into this spectacle. So he got disconnected from the abolitionist circuits. And, th and, th and Mo this happened to Moses Roper, another person I work on, too that he just wasn't as well connected. So um, in terms of, I don't know, it's a really interesting question about what, what William, William Wells Brown, I'm going to think about that too. Oh, hi. I got very interested in the Well, I think mm, that's a good question, challenge the borders inside us. I think often um, we, it, it's like that, there, there used to be a Saturday Night Live um, skit about Pat, and people are always trying to figure out, is Pat a man or a woman? And so we, inside ourselves, I think we, we, we do make these borders, like you're, you're one thing or another, you know, or I'm Martha J. Cutter, you know, I can only be such and such a way, I can only do such and such a thing. And, you know, I guess I'm just getting back to the idea of transformation. Like, I think when I was younger, I thought maybe I would always be this one person, and then you get older and you're like, you change. And, you know, so there, are, we also, I think, draw borders in our own, maybe in ourselves, is not, but in our mind. Like we draw these borders and we set up these categories and you know I struggle with this sometimes with my students where I'll say okay race is not physical and then or uh, not even just students but like I mean I I somebody was observing one of my classes once when I was a graduate student and I was teaching an African American playwright and the guys came and he said oh do you have any black students and I and I was like mm, I don't know. I mean, and he said, what do you mean you don't know? I'm like, I haven't asked them to self-identify, you know. Um, and and I, had, I had a student who I thought was mixed race, and I had another student who I thought was African American, but I never asked them. So, like, to kind of, maybe what I'm trying to say is challenge our own binary thinking over and over again and not, like, assume we always, I, I teach Charles Chestnut a lot, and he's really good that way. Like, don't assume you can judge a book by its cover. Don't assume you can compartmentalize you know, somebody who's um, teaching um, Patrice um, Con Killer's memoir. Um, uh, she's the founder of the Black Lives Movement. And she considers her about queer, but she has relationships with men. So, you know, for me at first, I was like, wait, does she gay or is she not gay? And then I was like, all right, well, you know, there, that's how she categorizes herself. And, you know, it doesn't mean she's not gay. That she, if that's how she, she calls herself queer, you know, so, and I don't even know if she's using that as a sexual distinction. So. To the, the borders we draw in our own mind, I think, um, is what I sh probably should have said. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah. So, yeah, there were a number of um, lecturers in England, the Crafts, and Douglas was there for a while, and Moses Roper, and uh, a, a bunch of other people. I, and um, um, So I don't really know how connected with, so Brown was there from 1850 to 1875, so I don't know if he connected with any of them because, like I said, he, um, he, he was kind of frowned upon for what he was doing, and I, I guess he was ostentatious in his dressing from what I can tell. Um, but I, I do talk about the crafts in um, my article, which is called As White as Most White Women, and um, all different kinds of racial passing. Um, I looked at advertisements for runaway slaves, and um, I found that they were passing for French, for Indian, uh, for free. There's a, two brothers who passed together, and one of them who's darker skinned is a barber. And he can read and write, but his brother who's light or skinned and can pass for white um, can't write. So there, there's a really interesting passing going on there. With, and also, he, he can do hair. The, ol the older brother who's darker skinned can do hair and makeup better. So like, and I talk about the crafts and um, Ellen passing for a white male. And um, I haven't actually found that many other cross gender passing advertisements. And that's a really interesting subject. Like, is she the only person who ever did that? I don't know. I mean, I found lots of other kinds of racial passing going on. Um, and But as far as I know, Brown wasn't really connected with, with those lectures in England. Um, that would be a good DH project, too, to see like where he was going and whether it overlaps. It has happened to Moses Roper. I listened to really, who was also a fugitive sl slave who ended up in England. Because he wasn't connected with the abolitionist lecture network, he and that was, I don't really, that was for a different reason, but he ends up going, uh, there's a DH project I saw, and he ends up getting pushed more and more to the margins outside of the periphery of England, further and further off the sort of traditional circuits that the abolitionists would go on. So I think that might have happened with Brown, too. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and he had um. Yeah, he. Yeah, um, P.T. Barnum also had a woman, I was trying to remember her name at lunch today, who he exhibited as um, George Washington's nursemaid. Does anybody? Yeah. Joyce yeah. Hemp, right. And so, but she was really, appears to have been exploited. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I had at one point written a grant proposal that I started with P.T. Barnum, and I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't know if I want it. It's, it, it, you know, and his exploiting of Joyce. Yeah. And and just he Brown's Brown was never like he never had a handler or a manager that I could figure out. So that's interesting too that he was like his own little performance machine there with his family. So, um, but you know that's a really interesting connection. Well, on that circular note, thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for all your questions. Thanks so much for your questions. That was great. That was really thoughtful.